eminences, excellences, fathers, um, dear friends, the main purpose of this presentation uh, and something which uh, been has something which has on up to now is to point out that essential key to understanding the first part of the mission in a consistent way is the notion of unification. Since the theme recurs in the second part, it also of the work to a certain extent. Several studies have shown the importance in maximum thought of the correlative notions of union and distinction. But what I have in mind here of union, considered either as an originally given state final one, but rather the notion of unification, which is not a static state, but a dynamic process separated or polarized, it should be noted that unification here does not signify either uniformity or confusion, since the unit, united elements always preserve their identity. This uh, theme in, is particularly present in the first part of the mystagogy, which at sight horizontal character, since it is dominated by architectural considerations. But the architecture of the church is in truth a place of movement and progression as well as of communication, exchange and communion in which union is dynamically achieved without confusion of the elements which for the man are a priori heterogeneous. The liturgy through the symbolism of his, its rites, manifests in its first part, called today the Liturgy of the Catechumens, this process of union, and in its second part, called today the Liturgy of the Faithful, leads it to a higher degree of the higher form of union, namely a supernatural union with God. The particular interest of the liturgy is that Beyond its symbolic contribution, it bestows upon the faithful the grace that allows them to accomplish this process of unification at all in its stages. The mystagogy thus offers both a comprehensive program of spiritual development and the strength that allows one to achieve this. Before examining exam examining the text of the mystagogy, it should be noted that unification is a fundamental theme of the thought of Saint Maximus the Confessor, so fundamental that a large part of his thought can be explained thereby, and it is surprising that no major study has been devoted to it thus far. This theme has been addressed by Maximus from various points, mostly in works prior to the mystagogy, which seems to date from 630, especially in letter two to John Cubicularius, probably written around 625, and in the ambiguous to John, which were probably written five or six years before the mystagogy, it appears again in, its work, in the works written afterwards, especially in the responses to Thalassios. We find in the mystagogy a synthesis of most of these points of view. This is the reason why the mystagogy is a work that is particularly appreciated as a spiritual treatise, especially since it attaches the synth this synthesis to the church, and in particular to the liturgy, which Maximus had practically never done either before or after its composition. <laughs>
One of Maximus' fundamental ideas is that man was created in a world, the universe is missioned from the beginning, not because this world was actually divided from the point of view of God, but because its unity has not been fully accomplished from the point of view of man. Man's task then, conferred upon by the, his creator, was to play in this respect the role of a mediator, a role so important in Maximus' thought that one of the greatest specialists of our author, Lars Thunberg, entitled his magisterial study on Maximus anthropology, microcosm, and mediator. The polarities man had to unit in this task are presented in chapter 7 of the Ambigua to John. These are, first, created nature and created nature in its entirely, entirety, second, sensible nature and intelligible nature, third, within sensible nature, heaven and earth, fourth, paradise and habited world, fifth, the constituents of man himself, including the duality of male-female genders. The ancestral sin not only diverted Adam, Adam and Eve from this vocation, but also became a source of separation and division, generating conflict between man and God, between man and woman, between all men, between man and the creatures of the world, between created beings, between the sensible world and the intelligible world, between the soul and the body, between the human faculties. The saving economy of Christ came to remedy this multiform division, achieving a unification of all that was divided and separated, taking into account the primary vocation of man and leading it to its end, beginning with the unification of man within himself and then all the other orders listed above. This is shown later by Maximus in chapter 41 of the Ambigua to John and is repeated later in chapter 48 of the Responses to Thalassios. Yet, it had also been addressed in a slightly different way in the commentary on the Lord's Prayer, evoking beyond the union of heaven and earth and that of the sensible with the intelligible, also the union of man and angels, and noting that Christ, I quote, showed the unity of created nature and how the world in the union of what is distant. Of course, the most important union, which is the end goal of our others, is the union of man with God, which Christ accomplished through his saving and deifying economy after uniting the human nature to the divine nature in his hypostasis through the incarnation. By this economy, Christ gave man the grace of being able to fulfill his first vocation once again. The spiritual life, in its double ascetic and mystical dimensions on the one hand, and in its liturgical dimension on the other, is the means for the faithful of assimilating this grace and of fulfilling thereby what Christ as accomplished for him. The first part of the mystagogy recapitulates the different elements of man's unitive task in relation to the church as a temple, which symbolically presents its model and which is the framework for liturgical action and a recollection of the unifying economy of the incarnate world world in which God's unifying power of God is made manifest. Liturgy accomplishes the elevation of the faithful towards God, 
and their union with him commensurate with the progress of his whole being, body, soul, and intellect in the three constituents of spiritual life, praxis, which aims through the keeping of the commandments to accomplish and unify in oneself all the virtues by eliminating patience. Theoria, which aims to gather through the reason and intellect that have been purified from the patience, all the logoi of nature, theologia, in direct knowledge, which in direct knowledge through divine revelation achieves perfect union with God. Chapter 1 of the Mystagogy shows, in a long passage within the second part, how the Church unifies the faithful in their uh, differences, which are no longer, as in the world, factors of division, separation, opposition, and conflict. But the first part of this first chapter has a much greater ambition than merely justifying this unification of the faithful. It shows how God unifies all created beings in their most tremendous diversity because he is both cause and end of all beings which can be seen in their logoi. We can therefore consider that the first part of the chapter one also concerns the other chapters of the first part of the Mystagogia because all the unifications that will be mentioned are in fact based on this first unification accomplished in God and by Him, both because He is the supreme model for them and also because He gives the grace that allows them to be accomplished. The unifying action of God is compared with the unifying action of the Church in chapter 1. On the one hand, God, I quote, maintains being by his providence both the intelligible and the sensible. He gathers them, circum circumscribes them, and binds them strongly to each other and to himself. But at the same time, the unification of beings is attributed to the power of relations that beings have towards God as principle and cause. It was also a quotation. There seems, therefore, to be a certain participation of beings in their unification, which is linked in their logoi. On the other hand, the unification of man in the church is attributed to the one simple and indivisible case of faith, which indicates their participation in the unification, but this affirmation is immediately followed by a reminder that it is God himself who carries out the work of union without confusion with regard to the essences of beings. There is, therefore, a synergy of the unification accomplished by God with the unification accomplished by the faithful, the latter agreeing, in fact, with the former. Chapter 2 and 3 deal with the unification of sensible and intelligible, intelligible created beings. Chapter 2 proposes to the faithful the unification of the sensible world and the intelligible world, of which the nave and the sanctuary are the image. This theme of the unification of the sensible world and the intelligible world is taken up again in chapter 7 and is summarized in chapter 23. From an architectural point of view, the nave and the sanctuary in the church are united as a whole, but Maximus is not satisfied with this, this static union. He also talks about their dynamic unification using the notions of potency and act. The nave, he said, is a potential sanctuary 
and converse, conversely, the sanctuary is a nave in act. This dynamic unification of the nave and the sanctuary is achieved not only by the litur liturgical action and the interactions and of its movements between the nave and the sanctuary by the entrances and exits, exits of the celebrant and the holy gifts, but also by the inner participation of the faithful in these liturgical movements. The sensible world and the intelligible world interpenetrate each other objectively, but this interpenetration, which is a form of unification, is to be accomplished by the faithful not only within the framework of the liturgy, but also outside it and outside the church as a temple, within the framer, framework of what Hans Urs von Balthasar called, in referring to Maximus' thought, a cosmic liturgy, which must characterize man's spiritual life, in particular at the stage of natural contemplation, physici theoria. Contemplation theoria is one of the fundamental elements of Maximian, of Maximian spirituality, together with the praxis that precedes it logically, not, chrono, not always chronologically, uh, and allows to access to it and the theologia that follows it, also uh, logically, is uh, uh, in which one surpasses the sensible world and the intelligible world in order to consider God alone in his transcendence. Contemplation is a capacity for the reason and the intellect, nous, to have been that have been purified of the patience through praxis to perceive the logoi of all, of all created beings, that is to say their spiritual definition relative to their origin and their end in God. In other words, it is the ability to perceive all beings in their intimate relationship to God and to reattribute them to their divine foundation. It thus elevates the contemplative to God and unites him to God in his relationship to nature before the knowledge of, the knowledge of God situated beyond nature and given directly by God takes its place so as to elevate the faithful to the highest union with God in a supernatural knowledge which surpasses all natural knowledge. Maximus explained this conception in several chapters of the, in the Ambiguo to John. We can link to this conception the Maximian, Maximian conception of the pyramidal structure of the Logoi through which the intellect passes ascending from the particular to the universal to finally reach the world in whom the Logoi have their origin and their end, as well as their su supreme unity. Chapter 3 explains that because the church in, it, in its plan is in its plan the image of the sensible world, it un unites heaven and earth. Here we find the affirmation that the church in its prayer and it, its liturgical action that bears Christ's universal plan of salvation includes all creatures of the world. But it is also addressed to the faithful as a spiritual program with the underlying idea that man is a microcosm who recap recapitulates in his body the wool of the sensible world, and who is called by virtue of the creator's design to realize in the cosmos the harmonious union of all creatures. Chapter three is linked to chapter two by its relation to the notion of the logoi, 
which testifies that God is the sole cause and end of the beings to which they relate, and by the idea that the man's contemplative intellect of, of man uh, is to spiritually realize the unification of all beings in the sensible world. This means that from a spiritual point of view, the sensible world cannot be considered independently from the intelligible world. Chapter four and five concern the, form, the forms and modes of unification proposed to the faithful of man's different components with the activities of the different stages of their spiritual development and the different virtues and the different modes of knowledge that they are to acquire. Chapter four shows how the elements of the human compound relate to the church in two, in two ways. First, the church is an image of man with the sanctuary being an image of the soul and primarily of man's reason, the altar an image of the intellect and the nave an image of the body. These images indicate that through his body, the faithful must manifest the keeping of the commandments. Through his reason, he will offer the logoi of beings to God. Through his intellect, he will finally gain access to mystical theology in the silence of unknowing. The sanctuary, the altar, and the nave are unified in the structure of the church, as being said before. The, no, no, excuse me. When the sanctuary, altar, and nave has been unified in the structure of the church, as has been said before, the soul, the intellect, and the body must also then be unified by the spiritual life of the faithful. This is why, conversely, man can be considered as being a church. The first part of chapter seven takes up the theme of the union of the soul and the body, but in a simpler way, by not detailing the composition of the soul and by substituting uh, by substituting in a recipro re reciprocal symbolism the word for the church, thus linking the task of the spiritual union of soul and body to the task of the spiritual union, union of the sensible world and the intelligible world presented in chapter two. Maximus explains that because the world is an image of man as composed of visible and invisible components, and conversely man is an image of the world as composed as a soul and a body, man thus has a task of uniting uh, his body and his soul. Although they are inseparable from their origin as constituents of the human being, the soul and the body need to be united by the spiritual life for different reasons. First, they are of different nature, the body being material and the soul immaterial, and there are tensions between them according to which the body tends to emancipate itself from the control that the highest faculties of the soul, the reason and will, exercise over it. Second, the ancestral sin gave primacy to the body, and the patients divided the body from the soul, with the body itself being torn by opposing qualities that arm each other. One of the tasks of the spiritual life is to restore the soul's authority over the body, to integrate the body with the spiritual life, and to cause both to act in concert and, and to, yes, and to, uh, and to uh, excuse me, uh, is to integrate the, holy, the body with the spiritual life 
and to cause both and to act in concert. Maximus insists on the fact that the soul and the body must collaborate in the acquisition of the virtues because the virtues concern them both to vary in degrees. He also emphasizes that both receive divine grace and that the body is deified along with the soul, man forming an inseparable wool from conception to resurrection. Chapter 5 explains that because the church is an image of the soul and the soul the church raison d'être, the faithful has, has the task of uniting the 14 elements of the soul's constitution and spiritual activity into seven pairs. First, intellect and reason. Second, intellectual power and vital power. Third, contemplation and practice. Fourth, wisdom and prudence. Fifth, knowledge and virtue. Sixth, unforgettable unforgettable knowledge and faith, and seventh, truth and good. First, reason and intellect must be reuni reunited, since through sin and the patience, the intellect becomes alienated in reason and in the senses, is then dissipated in sensible appearances, is carried away by the desiderative and irascible powers and submits to them and makes an effort to find ways of gratifying its sinful patience. As for reason, by exercising itself in an autonomous way, it develops a thought foreign to the spiritual life and puts itself at the service of sin and the patience. In chapter five, uh, 59 of the Responses to Thalassius, Maximus will explain how, in contemplation, which is a priori an activity of the intellect, reason is called to collaborate with the intellect. Second, contemplation and practice are very often cited together by Maximus throughout his work. They must form, in his view, a united and inseparable pair, the first reason being that they are fundamentally one by nature, complementary, and represent together the wool of the spiritual life, contributing to leading man to the same divine goal. The second reason being that the one never say, ceases to condition and confirm or verify the other. Practice, which does not issue into contemplation, remains incomplete. Conversely, any attempt at contemplation that is not based on practice is doomed to failure. Third, knowledge and virtue, which are also often cited together through our Maximus work, correspond in part to the true preceding elements since virtue is a fruit of practice and its effort to keep the commandments and it, in its work of purifying the patients, while knowledge include, includes contemplation and its extension beyond beings. Fourth, wisdom and prudence must be brought together, brought together because of the preceding considerations Prudence is a virtue of practical reason, while wisdom is a virtue of the reason and intellect in their contemplative function. Fifth, knowledge and faith must likewise be united, for faith is the necessary foundation of knowledge, and knowledge is faith in action and in, and in its perfection, Although first, it's also presenting, presented by Maximus as surpassing knowledge. The pair of faith and knowledge, however, is very rare in the work of Maximus, and it is possible that he has in mind here 
the passage of Ephesians 4, 13, which he had quoted in chapter 7 of the Ambiguous to John in the context of the notion of unification, evoking, I quote, the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man and to the measure and the, of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The reason for the presence of knowledge in Pairs um, 5, knowledge and virtue, and 6, unforgettable knowledge and faith, is that in Pair 5, Maximus understands under the term contemplation knowledge, while in Pair 6, knowledge means theology. A little further, further on, um, a little further on, in chapter 5, Maximus reduces the seven pairs to five, which therefore form a decade. First, uh, intellect and reason. Second, intellect, um, wisdom and prudence. Third, contemplation and action. Fourth, knowledge and virtue. And fifth, knowledge without forgetting and faith. He then shows how the different elements of this decade must be united and ordered in the soul's ascent to God. Once this decade has been united, the soul will be united with God. Maximus writes, it is a question of recognizing only that every soul will be united with God when, by the grace of the Holy Spirit, his own work and zeal, he can unite these realities with its other and even make them equal to each other. I mean that it can join reason to intellect, prudence to wisdom, action to contemplation, virtue to knowledge, and faith to knowledge without forgetting, since none of these realities are neither more nor less in relation to the other, all excess and all lack having been removed from them. In a word, when it can make the decade its, its own monad, then it will be united with God, the true, the good, the unique, and the only. End of the quotation. Chapter 6 explained that scripture is in the image of man. It is composed of the Old and New Testaments, just as man is composed of a body and a soul. The body symbolizes the letter and the soul the spirit. Maximus does not think here of the relationship between the Old and New Testaments in the form of a unification which would allow the two to subsist, but rather in the form of an obliteration of the Old Testament in favor of the New, which, will, which would include the former by surpassing it. The Old Testament represents the latter by its historical and factual content and by the primacy he grants to the law, and is also the shadow by the types it presents which are prefiguration of the realities to come linked to the incarnation of the world and of his saving economy. The letter fades to the extent that the spirit grows and, the, and uh, replaces it, just as the shadow of future realities fade to the extent that these realities are revealed and constitute the truth of faith. In chapter 10 of the Ambiguia to John, Maximus had explained how the contemplation of scripture, which is the second form of contemplation along with the contemplation of nature, discovers its spiritual meaning after having distinguished between the spirit and the letter and having surpassed the letter, the latter. He wrote in um, uh, particular, may 
what is true by figures and enigmas through an apophatic negation manifest to us what is hidden and overcome all faculty of representing and may we be raised ineffably towards the world by departing from the letter and appearances by the power of the spirit. One should recall that for Maximus, the goal of the contemplation of the Logoi of scripture, as with the contemplation of the Logoi of nature, is to elevate man to God in order to unite him to him, which takes place through knowledge, but also through the coming and indwelling of the world, which is embodied in a certain form in the Logoi of Scripture, just as in those of nature. This theme will be taken up again in the question in or responses to Thalassius. We then come to the liturgical part, the liturgical part of the mystagogy. We can distinguish between two parts, which generally correspond to what is called today the liturgy of the catechumens and the liturgy of the faithful. The first part includes chapter 9 to 12, which relate to the first stages of the spiritual life. It constitutes a preparatory phase for the second part containing chapters 14 to 21, where the realities of this world are overcome and where the highest union with God is accomplished. Chapter 8 is an introductory chapter to the two parts, which summarizes the saving and deifying economy of the incarnate world in its entirety, while chapter 13 forms a transition between the two parts. In the first part, chapters 9 to 12, the theme of unification does not appear. This part evokes the ascetic life from the point of view of praxis very generally, omitting the theme of contemplation. The latter appears in chapter 13 in connection with scripture. But the theme of unification appears only in the summary in, of chapter uh, 13, which is found in chapter 20. 23, where Maximus notes, with regard to the reading of the gospel, that the soul is brought to the one and only summit that receives their principles into a unity. I am speaking about the holy gospel in which our principle of providence and of being pre-exist in a unified form in the power that encompasses everything. End of the quotation. The second part, chapter 14 to 21, has a strongly eschatological dimension. The end of the reading of the gospel and the descent of the bishop from his throne mark the end of the present world and the coming of judgment while the closing of the doors and the dismissal of the catechumens signify, signify the abolition of sensible perceptions, where we therefore pass into the other world, that of the kingdom of heaven, which the liturgy henceforth symbolizes in its perfection, a perfection, however, that is presented to the faithful as belonging to the world to come. We find the theme of unification in chapter 17, the unification connected to eschatology in chapter 17, in chapter 19, in chapter 21. I don't give the quotation, you will, you will find them. Uh, it should be noted However, that the eschatological dimension clearly affirmed by the reference to the future in chapter 14 to 21 is counterbalanced 
in the recapitulation of these chapters made in chapter 23 and the two re recapitulation made in chapter 24 by the affirmation that unification, even in its highest stages, is now being accomplished, commensurate with the spiritual development of the faithful, even if the perfection reserved for the age to come has not yet, be, has not yet been attained. Let us look first at the summary in chapter 23. If chapter 15, concerning the descent of the high priest from his throne, inaugurates the eschatological part, the summary of this chapter in chapter 23 sees, it in, sees in it a symbol of the descent of Christ to the soul, which, uh, writes Maximus, separates as catechumens the thoughts which are still formed from the senses and, divis and divisible because of them from its perfect part, which obviously already applies to the current reality of the spiritual life with the ablation of thoughts and concentration being presupp presupposition of prayer in general and of participation in the second part of the liturgy, as mentioned in the cherubic hymn, let us know, lay aside every care of this life. While the formulation of chapter 17 concerning the divine kiss indicates an eschatological reality, the recapitulation made in chapter 24 indicates, by contrast, a current reality. Maxim, Maximus writes, by the divine, divine kiss, the grace of the Holy Spirit realizes a common, throw, a common thought, a unanimous will, and the same love of all towards all, and above all of each towards himself and towards God, God which corresponds to what has been stated in chapter 1 and also being a current as also being a current reality. The simple science evoked in the summary of chapter 16 to 18 is the science of the intelligible and therefore contemplation. We find nothing typically eschatological in the remark, which doubly take up the theme of unification, that, I quote, it is according to this science that it is permitted to see that God, the world, teaches the soul which has concentrated in itself its own powers and which is united by the intellect to the world by means of the spiritual kiss to confess with gratitude by the symbol of faith the unspeakable reasons and modes of its salvation. End of the quotation. In the summary of the chapter 18, we also remain, remain in the stages preceding theologia, theologia, accessible from now on the contemplative. I quote Maximus, from this moment, from this moment on, the soul is rendered as far as possible simple and indivisible by its instructions having encompassed by knowledge the principles of both sensible and intelligible things, the world then leads it to the knowledge of theology made manifest after the overcoming of all things. End of the quotation. The theology presented thereafter in the text is not mystical theology, but rather an explanation of the dogmatic truths concerning the Trinity that are contained in the Confession of Faith. Chapter 19 also speaks of a learning process of the soul and its instruction by the world through the synaxis, and it is only in the summary of chapter 20 that mention is made of the final 
fires of Ashkent, in which the soul attains the, the secret unity of God and experiences more than knows divine things. It should be noted that this supreme experience can already be can already be uh, made here below by the saints and is future only in its full accomplishment, implying in particular its permanence. Let us, know, let us now look at the two general summaries in chapter 24. It is important to note that chapter 24 begins by indicating that every Christian should be exalted to frequent God's holy church and never to abandon the holy synaxis accomplished therein because of the holy angels who remain there and who take note each time people enter and present themselves to God and they make supplication for them. Likewise, because of the grace of the Holy Spirit which is always always invisibly present, but in a special way at the time of the Holy Synaxis, this grace transforms and changes each person who is found there and, in fact, remold, remolds him in proportion to what is more divine in him and leads him to what is revealed through the mysteries which are celebrated. In other words, the synaxis not only foreshadows what is to find its fulfillment in the future, nor does it merely picture it, but also give the grace to accomplish it, it now as far as possible. In the first recapitulation, the theme of unification appears first in the summary of chapter 7, 17 concerning the divine kiss by which the synaxis realizes among the faithful the identity of concord and oneness and love of all with everyone and of each one with himself first and then with God. The summary of chapter 19 sees in the song Holy, Holy, Holy the realization by the synaxis of the union with the holy angels and elevation to the same honor, as well as the ceaseless and harmonious persistency in the sanctifying glorification of God. The summary of chapter, chapter 21 notes that the synaxis realizes by the proclamation of the one is holy and by what follows the grace and familiarity which unite us with God himself. Following these remarks and those concerning the other chapters, we can note that the participation in the spiritual realities which have been mentioned is even present, it, no, it, uh, is very present, or at least currently accessible, commensurate with each, per, each person's worthiness, but that it is distinguished from future participation in that is, in that is by faith, whereas future participation will be by vision. This participation by vision, says Maximus, will be done in the very truth, in a quite substantial, substantial way, in reality itself. This does not mean that the current participation by faith is false, without consistency and without reality, but rather, as Maximus specifies, that in vision, the faithful will be transformed into God himself. In other words, will reach the full measure of deification, having no longer any mark of corruption, that is, of the limits of this fallen world. The second recapitulation of chapter 24 brings only one new element, the summary of chapter um, 18 mentioned, mentioning the union with the soul of its own powers of the soul with its 
of the soul with itself and the simplicity which takes in under one form by the intellect the logos of the divine providence, and these two forms of unification also appear here to be currently achievable. We now come to the concluding part of chapter uh, uh, 24 and of my presentation too, which is also the conclusion of the treatise. The distinction Maximus makes between slaves, mercenaries, and sons indicates possible degrees of participation here below, and in the present, although the degree of son as and and it, in below and in the present, although the degree of son has its perfection in the hereafter, uh, in the fully actualized adoption that goes hand in hand with deification. In the in a second exhortation, not to stray from the church, Maximus insists again on the fact that the holy synaxis does not limit itself to symbolizing and or prefiguring, but rather fashions each one of each one of us according to Christ. Yet it does uh, so to the extent of uh, uh, one's worthiness, which is why Maximus returns at length before concluding his treatise to the ascetic presuppositions of a participation of in the holy synaxis that is the transformative, that is transformative. This confirms the idea supported in the first part of this presentation that the mystagogy is above all an ascetic and mystical treatise with, its, with the particularity which one does not encounter in the confessor's other analogous treaties of linking the ascetic life and mysticism to liturgy as a condition for effective participation in the latter and of emphasizing, emphasizing the importance of the liturgy in stimulating and nourishing the ascetic and mystical life. Thank you for attention. Thank you.